اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا ابي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد واهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقيه الله في الارضين روحي وارواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليك يا ابا عبد الله وعلى الارواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله ابدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله اخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى اولاد الحسين وعلى اصحاب الحسين الحمد لله we've had the tawfiq of discussing some of the verses of surah yusuf over the course of these days in preparation for the inevitable victory of islam and we hope that on these nights the imam who's watching us counts us as among the soldiers of islam we've come now to verse number 5 verse number 6 and we haven't completed the verse yet so this is what it says wa kadhalika yajtabika rabbuka wa yu'allimuka min ta'wil al-ahadith wa yutimmu ni'matahu 'alayk wa 'ala ali ya'qub we discuss this part of the verse and this part of the verse is what it says that is how your lord will choose you and teach you the interpretation of events and complete his blessing upon you and upon the house of yaqub up until now alhamdulillah we discussed this part of the verse we talked about what it means when allah chooses someone and we realized that this is actually a goal that we can go after we can try and achieve and allah does allow some people who really work on themselves to become amongst the mukhlasin we can reach a stage where we're purified where allah does the purifying after he sees effort on our behalf we talked about the interpretation of events and we also talked about the idea of having a complete blessing a complete blessing we said was when you are able to achieve take full advantage of the blessing and allah removes the obstacles that might be there to you taking full advantage of that blessing there's one last part of the verse and then after that inshallah a few lessons that we can get from the verse he says kama atamaha ala abawayk min qabl ibrahim wa ishaq in rabbaka alimun hakim just as he completed it earlier for your fathers ibrahim and ishaq your lord is indeed knowing wise there's a question that's answered in the tafsir they say why is it that ibrahim alayhi salam and ishaq were mentioned separately the ali yaqub the house of yaqub they were mentioned all together but then when it comes to these noble prophets why were they mentioned separately what we learn is that yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam would be the means or the wasila for allah completing that blessing on him and on the house of yaqub but allah had rewarded these other two prophets ibrahim and ishaq with the completion of his blessing but yusuf alayhi salam was not the means not the wasila not the reason that allah made that blessing complete so they also were honored with that but yusuf alayhi salam was not the means of that happening tonight we try to talk a little bit about dreams in islam dreams what we learn one lesson that we learn is that sometimes dreams carry a message for us there are times when allah favors us with dreams and these dreams carry a message for us we'll talk inshallah about what are some of the messages that we can get from dreams and how we use this in self building which is what we're trying to do over the course of these nights we hope that by reminding ourselves of the teachings of quran and sunna we will to change our hearts and that allah will see this effort on our behalf and bless us and reward us with the return of our master but sometimes dreams carry messages there's one dream that Imam Qadhim alayhi salatu wasalam relates our Imam he says that once in the in the people amongst the people of Bani Israel 
there was a righteous man, Rajulun Salih, a righteous man, and he had a righteous wife, Imra'atun Salih. Righteous man, righteous wife. And he had a dream. The Imam's relating his dream. He had a dream, and in that dream, a being came to him. Someone came to him in his dream. That person had a message for him. A message for him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, brother, your life will be divided into two parts. For one part of your life, you're going to have wealth, wealth and ease, security, everything you need, you're going to have that. He said, for the second part of your life, it's not going to be like that. The other part will be poverty. So now, the question is up to you. Which part of your life do you want first? Do you want to be wealthy and secure and happy and successful in the first part of your life? Or do you want to choose that for the second part of your life? So the man said, actually, I have a righteous wife and she's my partner. She helps me in my decisions, important decisions. I'd like the opportunity to share this with my wife, talk to her, and then together we'll come to a decision. And she was told, the man was told, that, okay, ذَلِكَ He said that that is okay. He went back to his wife, told her that, look, I've had such a dream, this kind of a message. What should we do? Should we choose the first part to be in ease and plenty, or we save that for later when we're older? Which one? And the wife told him, no, take it in the beginning. Do so much good with that, Insha'Allah, Allah is Arhamur Rahimi. The next day, after that, he had the dream again, meaning the being came back to him, spoke to him, and now, what's the decision? That's the decision. After that, and the hadith, the Imam says, the good times began after that. فَأَقْبَلَتِ الدُّنْيَا عَلَيْهِ مِنْ كُلِّ After that, the dunya turned to this, this man, was now all in his favor. This man had the Midas touch. Everything he would touch, basically in our words, we would say would turn to gold. The good life began. Now I mentioned that his wife was righteous. His wife was pious. So at this time, when the dunya came in his way, the dunya was there for him. Now he had wealth, riches, everything he could imagine. Every aspect of the dunya that you wanted to enjoy, it's all at his disposal. His wife pressured him, pushed him to do service in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She would be after him. Relatives, family members, brothers, neighbors, do good in the way of Allah. And he did that. His wife was giving him good advice. He did that. After a while, the first half came to an end. For that first half, he did everything he could in the way of Allah, but the good, the good times did come to an end, meaning the time came to the middle of his life. And that messenger came back to him in the dream. And the messenger told him this, he said, Inna Allah tabarak wa ta'ala qad shakara laka dhalik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so impressed with your actions, you followed that good advice from your family, so impressed with your actions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thanks you. Shakara laka dhalik. Walaka tamama umrik sa'a mithluma mada. He said, I have other good news for you. The rest of your life, you're going to live in this ease and plenty and good times. So that can happen. It can happen that someone has a message acts on that message, and enjoys the benefit. And with Yusuf now, connecting it back to our story, why was it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give Yusuf this message? Why is it that in the beginning of the mission, he needs to have this dream of the good times that are going to happen? Later on, if we get tawfiq to go through the rest of the story, you're going to see there's a lot of up and downs in the life of Yusuf going from being the son of a prophet, respected, beloved, to going to being thrown away by your own brothers and into a well, to being sold into slavery. Then later, to come out of slavery, basically, to live in the life of the 
second most powerful man in the kingdom to rise to glory and then again to go to prison and be humiliated. And then again, so his life has so many ups and downs. And what Allah Tabatabai, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala Alay tells us is that Allah wanted this dream to be a source of strength for him. Whenever, no matter how terrible the times got, he had this dream, my future is bright. Get strength and get energy from this. So that's a, a wonderful thing. Sometimes dreams have this wonderful mission for us or blessing for us. But there's a point, another point that I liked from this particular story that we had. And that is the blessing of having a righteous spouse. Imra'a saliha. That if one has this blessing, one definitely wants to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's mentioned in hadith that there are three things which are a source of comfort and ease for a believer. Thalathun lil mu'min fiha raha. Three things which are a source of ease and comfort for a believer. And one of them, and again, we want to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we are favored with this blessing in practice. He says, Wa imra'atun saliha tu'inuhu ala amrid dunya wal akhirah. One of them is that righteous wife. If Allah has favored us with a believing wife, a mu'mina, someone who helps us when it comes to this world and the hereafter, we want to be really grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. Sometimes blessings become ordinary for us. We don't appreciate them. We don't take them as seriously as we should. But that's a great blessing. Because it's not always the case that all spouses are like that. They're not always people who assist us when it comes to this world and the hereafter. If we have that blessing, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we don't, well, sometimes it's not like that. They say once, some people don't help one another get to paradise. Once there was a woman who went to paradise. A story they tell. A woman went to paradise. When she came outside paradise, there was a gatekeeper. She said, how do I get into paradise? The gatekeeper said, it's easy. You just have to spell a word. Really? What word do I have to spell? Spell the word love. L-O-V-E. She spelled it. He led her into paradise. Alhamdulillah. Good times. Enjoying. Then after that, her husband, when she was in the dunya, she used to be married to this man. But he came to think she wasn't very happy with the man. So she came to, he came to the doors of paradise. He wanted to come inside the gates. What's the rule? You've got to spell a word. Really? What word? Shakul Savakia. <laughs> Sometimes we're not like that. So if we have a spouse who's like that, we really want to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's a, a huge blessing. Now, the thing is though, instead of us just pointing fingers, sometimes what happens is that we hear this, for instance, a hadith like this or other hadith, a righteous wife, for instance, and then it's easy to sit back and point fingers. My wife should be like that. If I, was, if I had a righteous wife, what would I do in the way of Allah? But a believer, brother or sister, who's looking to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doesn't make these kinds of excuses. A believer looks inward, doesn't point the finger. If I want to look inward, I want to say, am I someone, male or female, married or not married? When it comes to the other individuals who are around me, am I someone who makes it easy for others to go to paradise or not? Am I someone who assists others when it comes to the dunya and then after that, more importantly, the akhirah or not? Or am I somebody who, because of my behavior, male or female, whether I'm dealing with my spouse, my siblings, my co-workers, other believers, non-Muslims, because of my behavior, other people may be pushed away from the path. I am the bala. I am the difficulty and affliction. And successful couples are those kind of couples. Those couples where both the husband and wife, independent of what the other person is doing, are the kind of person who's looking at themselves, wants to work on themselves, wants to improve themselves and do their responsibility. I'm not waiting on others to be better. I'm trying to improve myself. 
This is really important because sometimes what happens is that sometimes somebody like me, right? for the first part of my marriage, I've been shimmer. Right? I've been shimmer. Then I hear, oh, a hadith, I get a little bit of inspiration, I want to do the right thing. Then I think, okay, now for one or two days, I've been good. Now you be good. Right? I'm not doing it for the sake of Allah. I hear, inshallah, I'm doing it for the sake of Allah, inshallah. Right? But in reality, the reason I'm doing this good behavior is because I expect a reaction. I think if I do the right thing, then immediately the other person should do the right thing, and then everything will improve. Or sometimes it's not like that. Maybe the test is going to be that the other person is not going to be reformed immediately. And for me, I don't want to stop my own spiritual growth based on what others do. I have to do my responsibility. I have to look at what Allah wants from me. Am I someone, as a husband, as a spouse, as a co-worker, as a brother, a sister, am I someone who helps others come to paradise? When they look at my actions, are they inspired? And believe me, normal people, and again, I'm not doing this because it will have effect on others, but normal people are inspired by believers who act on the teachings of Islam. Many times, if you're like that, your spouse will respond. But I don't do it because my spouse, I'm looking, no, I'm looking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, trying to get to, closer to him. And I get that reward, I get what I'm looking for. So, there's a verse of Quran, just to remind us about this, because we want to be people who encourage others through our practice to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a beautiful verse of the Quran for us to think about in our interactions with others. Whether they're Muslims, whether they're non-Muslims, whether they're Shia, whether they're Sunni. Right? Interactions with others. Beautiful verse, inspiration for us. Because as I mentioned before, sometimes amongst practicing Muslims, like myself, we're not tolerant enough when it comes to others. I'm so right, I'm on the right path. I, right? My behavior doesn't attract others. Maybe it's in my personal life. Maybe it's when it comes to my children. Maybe when it comes to my spouse. Too fixed on doing what I think is right. But there's a beautiful verse as a reminder for us. This is found in Surah number 48 and its first number 29. Muhammadun Rasulullah. Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارِ رُحَمَاءُ بَيْنَهُمْ Those who are with the Prophet are people who when it comes to the enemies of Allah are severe, are harsh, are fierce, but amongst themselves they're merciful. We want to make sure that we are the kind of Muslims that the Quran and Sunnah preaches to, for us to be. Merciful amongst ourselves when it comes to the enemies of God, not just regular non-Muslims, oh, okay, you said kofar, so now let me get these guys. No, we have other verses when it talks about people who are not fighting us in the way of Allah. In Surah Mumtahina. But when it comes to those enemies of God, yeah, Muslims are, are strong when it comes to the enemies of God. But mercy when it comes to being amongst ourselves. I want to share a story with you that is inspirational for us. Inspirational for us. There was a man named Muhammad Burunjurdi. And Muhammad was a man who was a good mu'min, and it wasn't that he was a coward. He had this trait that you'll see in the verse of the Holy Quran, but this man was a tough guy. He was a, a bad dude. Bad. Let me give you the story. Before the revolution, in Iran, they used to have a group of secret service people called the Savak. The Savak were like the FBI. Huh? Like the FBI. Intelligence, but those guys, they would get you, they would torture you, they would do terrible things to your family. Savak, very terrible. This guy reached a stage, Muhammad. He came to one of his friends. These Savak were the enemies of Islam, he told his friend, he said, look, I need you to give me a revolver, a pistol. Give me a revolver. He said, well, why do you need a revolver for? 
He said, there's a member of Savant. This guy's really bad. This guy deserves death. Really bad guy. Enemy of Islam. He said, I can't give you a revolver. I have a revolver, but I can't give it to you. He said, why won't you give me the revolver? He said, this revolver doesn't work properly. You'll go over there. You'll try and kill that guy, and the revolver will give you problems. He said, no, you give me the revolver. Let me take care of the rest. After a few days, he saw Muhammad. He said, Muhammad, what happened? He said, yeah, remember that Savak guy? I saw him once in the streets, the alleys. I took out the revolver. I tried to kill him, and it didn't work. Then what happened? The Savak guy saw me. I went for my gun. He went for his gun. Muhammad was so tough, he jumped on the Savak guy, held him down, took out his revolver, and with the butt end of the pistol, killed the Savak guy. So Muhammad is a, a rough cat, right? He's not easy. A bad dude. The reason I mention this. There's another story about this same Muhammad. Later on, this guy was the commander in an area called Kurdistan of the Revolutionary Guards. And he hears outside of his office, he hears people making noise, shouting, making noise. So he comes outside the office. What's happening? The head of the office tells him, there's a soldier who's just come back from being on leave. We just gave him leave, he went on leave. He's coming back, now he's asking to go on leave again. He just came back. So he's the head of the entire military unit. He tells him, he said, look bro, you, you can't do that, you just came back from leave. You can't go on leave. The soldier got so upset, he walked over to him and he slapped him in the face. His military commander, Muhammad. Huh? Muhammad's not. They said Muhammad just smiled and he brought his face forward. He said, son, you've got heavy hands. You hit me on this side of my face. Hit me on this side to straighten my face out. <laughs> then he took the guy and brought him into his room. The soldier took him and brought him into his room. He said that, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was so urgent for you to go. I'm going to tell these guys to give you three days. You go ahead and you go get leave, take leave for three days. The soldier was shocked. A person in a position of power, a person who's strong. He left the office. When he left the office, he went to the head of the office. The head of the office was making the calls, coordinating for him to go. He said, you're calling for me to go on leave? He said, no, I don't deserve leave. I don't deserve leave. He's shedding tears and walks out the office. The guy who's telling the story says, later on, this same soldier became the bodyguard of Burunjit. Eleven months later, eleven months later, he achieved the lofty rank of Shahada. He never went on leave until the end. Point being, if we're people who are Ruhama Bainahum, instead of Oh, you did this to me? I mean, let's say my personal relationship with my family. Tit for tat. You did this, I'm like this. Usually, instead of being like that, if we're people of rohama, we can overlook the mistakes of others. We're concerned about bigger, more important things. These kind of people, yes, it's true. The majority of mankind is attracted to this, changed by this. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah. So we have to really work on that. We have to work on making sure that our character is such that it attracts people to the deen. We're soft, we're nice, we're kind, we're gentle, and this attracts others to the religion. But there are some people who make a mistake in this regard. When it comes to tolerance and unity and being with others, there are some people who make a mistake. For the vast majority of mankind, we have to be that way nice and gentle and kind, but there's some people who make a mistake. There are people who faint on the wrong side of the curtain when it comes to this. They say back in Iran there was a guy, and this guy, they used to have the Azadari for Imam Hussein, Matam. So they would stand, there would be a curtain between the brothers and the sisters, and they would have the Azadari, they'll be shouting, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. He would do the Matam, and this guy would faint. But unfortunately, he would always faint on the sister's side of the curtain. Some people are like that when it comes to unity. 
want to fade on the wrong side of the curve. No, there's, we talked before about having a principled stance when it comes to Islamic unity. Principled stance. Right? We're not talking about being unified with those. And let's set aside the mu'mineen, the majority of mankind. I'm not talking about that. But being unified with those who being unified with them serves the cause of the enemy. They're serving the cause of the enemy. They're hurting the cause. And how unity, let me go over, like how some people, their philosophy, can't we just all hold hands? Well, it's principle, let's take a stance, be brave, have a spine. No, sometimes, yes, unity with the vast majority of mankind, but there are some times when the moment has to take a stance. So there are some people who do the work of the enemy without being on the payroll of the enemy. They're on the, they're on the payroll. There are a lot of people know. That. And again, I'm not talking about Mu'mini, I'm talking about those who know, scholars, doing the work of the enemy without being on the payroll. How do I know? How do I know somebody's doing the work of the enemy, the enemies of Islam? Normally, with these kind of people, you'll find that they're against this ayat of the Qur'an. The ayat of the Qur'an says that I'm supposed to be harsh when it comes to the enemies of Islam, and merciful when it comes to believers. With these people, they're harsh when it comes to believers, then when it comes to the enemies of Islam, you may even hear them praising them. For instance, let me make it a little bit more practical. The representatives of the imam are the maraja. The maraja are the representatives of the imam of the time. Let me make it even more simple. I don't think anybody has any doubt in their mind that Israel is the enemy of Islam. If somebody does, they need to have their head examined. They're not rocket, they're not rocket science. Israel's enemy of Islam. Okay. On the other hand, Sayyid Nasrullah, for instance, one of the mu'mineen, he is fighting the enemy of Islam, right? We know that also. If someone takes a stance which is against the Maraja, against Sayyid Nasrullah, then we got to... I can't be unified. We'll all hold hands together? No, I'll take a stance against you. So we don't mean that when it comes to unity. Now, one more point about dreams now. Go back to our original discussion, which was a discussion about dreams. And it's important for us to have some of this information because sometimes people will misuse our information on dreams and use it to work against us. Dreams in Islam, in Quran, are important. There are eight dreams that are discussed in the Holy Quran. In addition to that, you also have heard the stories of the dreams that are discussed on the story of Karbala. So Islam discusses dreams. And the second point is that there is a reality to dreams. Right? There are some dreams that are true. Some of us may have experienced, or we've heard of others who've experienced true dreams. So let's get a little bit of Quranic information, information from the tafsir on dreams itself. And then finally, let's see how we're able to use dreams in self-building and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first point is that most dreams don't reflect any higher reality. Most of your dreams, you're a little sick, a little cold, a little hot. Most dreams don't mean anything. But it doesn't mean all dreams are meaningless. There are some dreams that have a reality. Let me give you one more story. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We all know the shuhada are alive, right? We have that verse of the Holy Quran. Don't consider those who were killed in the way of Allah to be amwat, to be dead. They're alive, getting rizq from their Lord. I want to give you a true story, and it's involving a dream. There was a guy, and he was working at a morgue. Working at a morgue. 
and they brought some of the bodies of the shohada to the morgue. So he's a guard, he's working. He fell asleep, and when he fell asleep, he says one of the shohada came to him in his dream. It just brought three bodies. One of the shohada came to him in his dream and told him, he said, don't deliver my body to my family yet. Don't deliver my body to my family yet. So he woke up from the dream. He said, wait, did one of the shohada, they were communicating to me in this dream, telling me something. Don't deliver my body? What does that mean? Then he thought about himself. How is that? They're dead. It's just a dream. Goes back to sleep. Again, the shaheed comes to him. He says, don't deliver my body to my family. This time he says, what's your name? What's your name? And he tells him his name. His name is Amir Nasir Soleimani. He says, I woke up from my dream. I went over to the bodies. I saw the three bodies. One of them was written, Shaheed Amir Nasir Suleiman. Suleimani. So he said, I didn't know why he wanted us to deliver, de delivering the body, but he'd come in the dream. Okay. He said, years later, I found out why. Years later, after some research, I found out that actually that day we had wanted to deliver his body, his brother was having a wedding. He didn't want his body to be delivered and the wedding to fall apart. Everybody crying. So there, are, there is a reality to dreams. And we have a discussion in Al-Mizan about this. Al-Manamat Al-Haqqa. True dreams. Now there's one part of this that's a little bit technical. There's a science called Ilm nafs And Allah Ta'ala explains what they said what they say in this section. So it's not something I understand. Let me just explain to you what he says about the reality of true dreams. He says, this is what he says, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says there's, there's three realms of existence. There's alam wa tabi'a, the natural world, the physical realm that we live in. Then there's alam al-mithal, the imaginal realm, and then there's even a higher plane of existence than this called Alim al aql So three realms of existence. He says that that's the realm of the, uh, the intellect. He says what happens, he says, is that there's a relationship of cause and effect between these different realms. So the relationship of cause and effect between these different realms. And he says what happened is that when we go to sleep, our nafs, our soul, is cut off from the external world and it travels to one of those other realms. This is what they say in the science of Ilm al-Nafs. What you witness over there depends on the readiness of the soul and its predispositions. Depending on, this happens mostly to pure people. It depends on the readiness of the soul. What the soul sometimes will witness will be lights and generalities. Sometimes they'll see what's going to happen in the future as images or forms that it's familiar with. Right? And sometimes, he mentions, the nafs meddles in these dreams. But this can happen. And actually, we have hadith that say that in the end of time, in akhir zaman this is what it says about the mu'min. Ra'yul mu'min. That the mu'min, the believer, his opinion and his dreams in the end of times will be on 70 parts of the parts of nubuwa. So it can happen. Now, so there are true dreams. Now what's our responsibility and how can we use true dreams to get us closer to God, which is our responsibility. We're not looking for book knowledge per se. How can we use this to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How does this affect us practically? One point that we learn from the teachings of Ahlul Bayt is that we're not supposed to um, base our lives around dreams. We're not supposed to base our jurisprudence or our lives around dreams. I saw this in a dream, even a true dream, even a true dream. Sometimes somebody will have a dream up until the end of their lives. What's going to happen? And it starts to take place. 
one step, step one, step two, step three, they'll go to some of the orafa. Say, well, look, I have, a, I had a dream. It's true. It's starting to come true now. Does that mean I'm com I'm compelled to move in this direction? And they tell them, no. You act on your apparent taklif. What I can see, what I know, what my duty is. It's a mistake if any believer starts to base their life around dreams. Mu'mineen are not supposed to do that. We, have, we are supposed to follow the instructions of Ahlul Bayt. As soldiers of the Imam, one of the first, and this is, I'm going to just say it briefly because we're running out of time. But this is one of those fundamental pillars when it comes to self-building. It's not an easy thing. It's not small. I'm going to say it quickly though. As a soldier of the Imam, there's a couple of steps if you want to take bigger steps in the way to self-building. One of them is enjoying yourself as a mu'min. One of them is getting enough sleep, sleeping properly. Sometimes what happens is people end up getting a habit where they stay up late into the night. Sometimes two, three. Sometimes what happens, even if they're soldiers of the Mahdi, or they want to be soldiers of the Mahdi, they end up sleeping right through Fajr. Get a nice, good sleep. Alhamdulillah, wake up at 8 in the morning. Fajr, Qadha, every day. Getting enough sleep. And bodies are different. We have to find out how much sleep my body needs. Getting enough sleep is actually important in, when it comes to self-building. So that, rest, exercise, eating properly. If you come to the Orafa and you tell them about your dreams, I had this dream, alhamdulillah. A lot of times I say, go have a, a nice meal, have some kebab, everything will be okay. So, if I want to be a soldier of the Imam, I don't base my life around dreams. Am I doing my responsibility? And what's my responsibility when it comes to the self-building? Those four principles that I mentioned. In addition to that, when it comes to dreams, we don't think that dreams mean, because I had a good dream, I saw the A'imma, I saw Ahlul Bayt. We don't think, we don't assume that means I've achieved a lofty spiritual station. Sometimes that's a mistake that I can make. I'll have a good dream. Oh, that means I'm, you know, I am one of the Orafa, one of the awliya, alhamdulillah. That dream, that doesn't happen to everybody. Me, I'm, I'm ready, imam. We look at ourselves. We look at our responsibilities. When it comes to sin and ma'asi of Allah, am I avoiding that? When it comes to akhlaq and sacrifice, am I making sure that I... Am I ready to step on my ego for the sake of Islam? Those are signs that I'm making steps, making progress. Not having a dream or a good dream. What are dreams? Dreams are encouragement. When you have those good dreams, let me give you a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is how we can use dreams for self-development. One of the ways, we're going to cut the discussion short. One of the ways is this. Dreams are encouragement and sometimes warnings. We have hadith that the Prophet would speak to the believers after in the morning and he would tell them, he would say, does anybody have good tidings? He meant dreams. So what happens is if you have some of those good dreams where you see Ahlul Bayt, you have these good dreams, those are good tidings, encouragement that something you're doing is right. Does it mean everything is good? Allah has accepted me? No, not that. One step at a time. But it's encouragement. Sometimes it's a warning too. Allah will show you something terrible in your dream. There's a mistake that I'm making. So we want to use dreams in that way. Now, tonight we would like to remember one of the shuhada of Karbala. And one of the companions says that I came to Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi and I told him, we were in a group, he said, one of us came and told the Imam, he said that, inni kathiran ma." He said that I, many times I remember Imam al Hussein like we're trying to do tonight. He said that I remember him. He said, tell us, what should I say when I remember him? What should I say when I remember him? 
And the Imam gave him instructions. He said, say this three times. Sallallahu alayk ya Aba Abdullah. Sallallahu alayk ya Aba Abdullah. Sallallahu alayk ya Aba Abdullah. We want to remember those wonderful companions of the Imam. We have such inspirational stories when it comes to the Imam. And we are remembering them, hoping that we can do these same things for the Imam of our time. One of the companions, before we get to Hor, who we want to actually talk about, is a man who, when he was told to abandon his Imam, that I take back my bayah, you go, you escape, he said these words. He said, Wallah, I swear by Allah, Law alim tu anni uqtal, thumma uhya, thumma uhraq, thumma uhya, thumma udra, yuf alubi, thalika sabaina marra ma farraktuka. He said that if I was told I was killed, then brought back to life, then burnt, then brought back to life, then my ashes were scattered. And this happened to me 70 times. I would never abandon you. We hope that our Imam who's watching our session tonight says this about that, sees this determination in us tonight. One of the companions who we'd like to actually have Masa'ib for tonight is a man named Hur. Hur was someone who was so wicked that he was one of the leaders of the army of Yazid. He was sent out before the battle began. He's the one who met the Imam, the commander of a brigade with a thousand people, stopped the Imam of his time from going to Kufa. When his Imam tried to go to Medina, he wouldn't let his Imam return to. But this man achieved the rank of martyrdom. How did he become one of the shuhada? How did he become one of the shuhada of Karbala? There's a secret in this and a lesson for, in this for us we want to do in self-building. Perhaps it was because of his respect and honor of the Imam. He was very respectful. One of the stories that they tell about him is that when he stopped the Imam, the Imam said, do you want to pray with your people or will you pray with us? He said, no, you lead the prayers and we'll pray with you. Sometimes, if I'm a kind of person, even if I may have some mistakes, but there are some sins I won't commit, I keep some light alive in my heart, that will be enough to save me. And that saved Hur. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.